for all of you stock nerds like us or maybe you like charts and data thank you for watching the second longer video if you will so let's look at some charts and data from the third quarter The first thing we're going to look at, we usually start with the headline roundup. So three headline, it gives you sort of pretty good theme of what happened during the quarter. Cargo piling up. We all know that, you know, if you've gone shopping lately, not all of the goods that you're looking for are there when you need them. And that is explained by basically ships, cargo ships standing idle off the uh, large ports of North America. This headline talks about the California ports. We have soaring energy prices. If you've paid your Enbridge gas bill or your, your, you put fuel in your car in the past few months, you know that prices have gone up. The question is, um, how, what impact is going to have on climate action? Um, everyone wants to save the polar bears, but once it's done, when it's, if it becomes very costly, one would question whether that the fervor and the political will will stay with us. Job openings, that remains a mystery. There are a lot of people um, or a lot of businesses looking for jobs and a lot of openings that remain unfilled. That, those are the, basically the three uh, headline roundups that really covered the essence of what transpired in the past quarter. One of the themes that we want to cover was unintended consequences. So we're going to cover three concepts of unintended unintended consequences, more specifically when it comes to underinvestment. We're coming out of a pandemic, some would say we're still in it, but at the end of the day, um, healthcare has been a topic of conversation for the past 18 to 20 months. So the question is, and from an investment perspective, we're coming at it from an investment perspective, is healthcare that big of a deal, for lack of a better word? Is it that important, that important of a component when it comes to the, the Canadian economy? or each country's economy. So in Canada, based uh, from 1975 to 2019, we've spent, um, say in the past four or five years, we've spent close to 12% of GDP on healthcare. That has gone up substantially since the 70s. And in fact, when universal healthcare started in 1962, as a percentage of GDP, spending a healthcare system was was not as important as it is today. Now the question is why is that? Why are we spending basically 60-70% more money than we did as a percentage of the economy since 40 years ago, 45 years ago? And the other question is um, I mean nominally we're spending a tremendous more much more money. I mean we stop and think about it 7% of GDP is significantly less than 12, but don't forget the GDP in 1975 was significantly less in Canada than it is today. So on a nominal basis, spending is up substantially. As investors, that's something that you want to know more and respect. So if you stop and think about it, why has that spending gone up so much? The reason is life expectancy. In 1962, when Tommy Douglas came out in Saskatchewan with universal health care, life expectancy was 71 years old. It's 83 years old and expected to go up over time. So those 12 years that we've added to people's life expectancy are the most expensive from a healthcare perspective. So it only follows that the percentage of JDP devoted to healthcare has also gone up. The next level of underinvestment and unintended consequences could be infrastructure spending. But before that, let's before we get into it, let's define GDP or gross domestic product. For those of you that remember your economics classes, you don't need to. I don't. This will be review. And for those of you that may not have taken economics or simply don't remember, gross domestic product, which is a measure of an economy, is made up of government spending, consumer spending, private investment, and net exports. And so G. We talked about healthcare spending, that comes from the G, and then other big component of G in terms of government spending would be infrastructure. So infrastructure is really airports, all sorts of transportation, municipal infrastructure, telecom, all the sort of hard assets a country will build. So what we have here, going back to 2018, is spending as a part of GDP in China, nearly 6%. Other economic powerhouses like Albania or Bulgaria are one to two percent 
of GDP in terms of spending. Granted, those are small economies, but still, as a percentage of their economy, it's a significant investment for them. Canada, Germany, other developed nations, we're closer to half a percent. So all the political conversations that we're hearing about as of, time, as of the time of this recording, we're hearing about $550 billion over five years being spent in, in the U.S. on infrastructure spending. Now the question is, and that's on top of the 140 or so billion dollars that was spent on infrastructure in 2020 in the U.S. Now the real question is, is it just spending that we're catching up because the numbers were so small in terms of GDP as opposed to other nations? Or is it really another question of um, it was sorely needed or is it really just a, another form of GDP stimulus? And that's really, depending on where you fall, um, probably that we'll give you the, your opinion on it. But, but mathematically, what happens, and it's important to remember, if government spending goes up because the governments decide to build new transit systems, um, you can have a crowding out effect. What happens is the dollars spent by government need to be paid for it. So they'll often, they will often be borrowed, but those borrowings need to be paid off by uh, or, or paid for by higher taxes. That may, might or may shrink consumer spending or, or crowd out private investments. So what do I mean by what do I mean by crowding out? Well, if there are no if the price of concrete goes up because everyone all the governments are building roadways or bridges, the private sector will uh, be priced out of the concrete business, if you will. And so there's no it's not a direct link is my point between government spending going up and GDP going up by the same um, percentage. And net exports obviously have an impact on GDP as well. In Canada, net exports are largely driven by commodities. We can also talk about underinvestment. Well, what we have in underinvestment here, as an example, are companies that are underinvesting. So here we have Kimberly Clark, which is, uh, those are these, their sales, um, basically flat, right around inflation, 1.8%. So nothing to write home about. We're seeing dividends being paid. So why are the dividend, dividends being paid? Are they shrinking their dividends? No. What they're doing is they're buying back their own shares. So one has to ask their questions. Well, where's the money coming back? Well, what Kimberly Clark is specifically doing is that they're borrowing more money and go out, going out into the marketplace and buying back their own shares. So what does that mean? Well, one school of thought said, well, that's good because it supports the, the stock price. But longer term, as an investor, you start questioning because the debt will remain, but the company will, no be, will not be better for it. I mean, they haven't invested in new plants, new markets, or any sort of longer term uh, investment that you would want to see as a long term shareholder. Then we can talk about resource companies. There's been a lot of political pressure on the part of, of resource extraction companies. So what do I talk about? I mean, I mean oil and gas companies, copper mines, um, sawmills, timber companies. A lot of companies are being asked to be better corporate citizens by lowering their carbon footprint. That really means curtailing their operation. So here we have Shell. Royal Dutch Shell, and that spelling mistake is not mine. I really, that was part of the, comes from Statistica, and I guess they made a spelling mistake. I've been known to make spelling mistakes, but this one is not mine. But anyway, my point here is exploration budgets have been going up, and they've been coming down ever since 2013. Now, one could argue maybe it's because the commodity prices have come down, and that, to a point, could explain some of it. But really, at the end of the day, if a company is not replaced or replacing their commodities or their underlying resource base, uh, two things will happen. Over time, they'll be less profitable because they will not be able to extract as much. But in the short term, their financials look a lot better. Why? Because they're cutting budgets and this lower budget, you know, going from, say, 16 billion to the mid 20s. Well, that's a significant cut. And that lower cut means that they have more money to buy back shares, more money to pay higher dividends, and more money to um, retire debt. 
So in the short term, it makes the company actually look more valuable, very much like borrowing money to buy back shares. But in the longer term, is that a good um, thing for an, from an investor perspective? The other unintended consequences that we want to cover this quarter is one around demographics. So we all know that there's a demogra- there's a link, a direct correlation between demographics and economics. We know that, for instance, between the ages of 39 or 40 and 54 or 55, that is when most of us are most active economically, meaning we put into the economy more than we take out. Prior to, say, age 40, we're still studying. We're not yet in that household formation or household formation is still happening. And past the age of 55 is usually when people start leaving the workforce. But in between, those are the active um, or that is the active um, section, if you will, of, uh, of a economic agent's life cycle. So what I wanted to draw your attention to is the baby boomer, baby boomer generation, so 1946 to 1964. And if we added, say, 40 years to 1946, that would bring us to 1986. Now, remember the date 1986, and then 1981 plus 40 brings us to 2021, which is this year. So what I am showing you here is the S&P 500 from 1945 up to of late, September 20th, 2021, the end of the quarter. And you'll notice that the market has got has these sort of long phases to the upper right, which we all like as investors. Those are called secular bull markets. And then you have these flattish sections. Some people call them bull markets, lost decades. There's a whole lot of names for them. Basically, this is the time when it really is hard to be an investor. Here's a level of 60 on the S&P 500. And from 1960 to 1974, the market really hovers in this box right around between 60 and 100. That's kind of where it lives. So for a very long period of time, the market does nothing. And then we enter this other long secular bull market and then another flat part. So why does that even matter? Remember those dates that I gave you, 1946? Well, this market really turned around in the mid 80s, right around when the baby boomers turned 40 or the older baby boomers turned 40. And that market lasted, the secular bull market lasted till 2000. Again, 55 years after the uh, first baby boomers were born. It's so the fit is uncanny. It doesn't mean that as an investor, you don't have any volatility. Some of the largest volatility we saw was during this secular bull market, 1987 crash, the early 90s, the savings and loans, and also the um, Asian crisis and the, the Russian debt crisis of the late 90s. And then we had this sort of lost decade in the S&P 500, we have one crash, this would be the tech crash, and then 08, 07, 08, 09, and then here we go. And again, here we are in, 1921, in 2021, and so we're seeing this bear market, or um, this bull market beginning. So many of us are thinking, well, gee whiz, you know, the market has gone up so much, there's no way it can continue to go up, especially after, during a pandemic, all these negative thoughts. Well, remember that this bull market lasted 17 years. So again, thinking about better than expected outcomes, perhaps, just perhaps, the millennials will be the fuel of the next secular market, the secular bull market. So again, we're trying to keep better than expected outcomes and worse than expected outcomes and trying to study them both. The demographic, the demographic um, impact of the millennials should be viewed as something positive for the economy and maybe the markets. Here's another wall of worry concept or chart that I want to convey. This is the price of, of uh, a gallon of gas in the U.S. Um, this is a national average, and we're at, you know, $3.40. It is not the same sort of chart as the oil and gas prices or the, the price of the oil and gas stocks. So what's interesting is that either the market doesn't believe that gasoline prices will remain this high or that the stocks have a lot of catching up to do. 
Let's go back to our market attribution. So this is the top 20 in the US and in Canada. If we look at Canada, the top 20, what's interesting is we don't have any of the large banks or large financials or something like Shopify anywhere in the top 20 for the quarter. What we have are smaller cap companies, much smaller companies, which is really a good measure of um, the, ap the appetite of investors to invest in quote unquote riskier companies. And then the other thing to understand is that it, it's very broad. There's, it's not necessarily one sector that is being represented in terms of the leaders. That's also another sign of health. On the laggard side, what we're seeing are, you know, certain sectors like silver and gold mining, but also leaders of the past. Aurora and Canopy Growth were stellar performers um, four or five years ago, three or four years ago, I should say. And Ballard Power was a stellar performer up until about a few quarters ago. On the U.S. side of things, again, you're, you, one would expect to see the large tech names. They're nowhere to be seen. And also smaller cap names are making, are, are, are making it to the leaderboard. And again, just like in Canada, the selection or the cross-section is quite broad, which is another sign of health. On the laggard side, there is no particular sector except maybe Las Vegas, but otherwise there's no real discernible trend in terms of sector underperformance. Really what you're seeing are certain names that are have been beaten up on the part of investors or sold off. And sometimes it could be just for um, operational reasons. And so for, for us here at Exponent, sometimes these laggard tables are um, the start of our shopping list for investment ideas. So our conclusion, is inflation transitory? That's really going to be the question going forward. Why does that matter? Based on central banks assessing that or coming to the conclusion of whether or not inflation is transitory will determine the path of interest rates. That's why it matters. The K recovery, it's still in place. The, the difference between the renters and the asset owners and the renters, that difference or that chasm between the two is going to be very important because government will try to to bridge that gap as much as policies with as much as possible with policies and i would add to that central banks as well and so policies both from governments and from governments and from central banks will really weigh in heavily on determining the winners and the losers supply of goods and and of people and that remains a challenge going forward it's very difficult to have a strong economy when goods and people aren't moving through the economy efficiently. Right now, um, goods and labor are moving through the economy in a, in a clumsy way. We will continue to focus on brands, on companies that have solid brands. Those are moats. We're also looking for companies that have an ability to distribute their products, ideally online, if they have a strong online presence. That goes for both services and for goods and then innovation they add value they solve a problem either they solve a problem for a great many of their customers that are willing to pay for the solution or they are few um, customers but the problem is very important and it's very costly to solve and so their customers are willing to pay up and, and continue to do business with them for the long term as always thank you so much for watching i am benoit poliquin for exponent investment management. If you have any questions or comments about this video, if there's things that you would like to see in future videos, please drop us a line. Thank you so much for watching.